Today on BRS TV, we have the next episode in the Saltwater Basic Series. And we're going to go over the next steps of owning a tank, which is water, rock, and sand. Water is probably one of the most basic components of a saltwater tank. You have a few different sources for your water. Tap water with a water conditioner, purified water from your fish store, or you can produce your own filtered water right in your own home. Tap water with a water conditioner or dechlorinator is a possible option. I would say it's more commonly used by people new to saltwater aquariums and sometimes fish only systems. If you have a good quality water source, it can be a suitable option, but most people will eventually gravitate to some of the more reliable options, especially if you're planning on a reef tank with sensitive corals. A more common option is to purchase filtered water from your fish store. This is typically reverse osmosis deionized water, which basically has all of the contaminants removed from the water and extremely pure. Better yet, it's usually pretty cheap. Many of the stores will even sell water pre-mixed with salt, so you don't have to do anything but pick it up and bring it home. An increasingly popular option is to produce your own filtered water at home. Reverse osmosis systems like these have become really affordable and easy to use, which is probably why it's become such a popular option. It's really hard to beat the convenience of being able to produce ultra-pure water basically on demand. Systems like this can look complex, but really there are only three houses. One that screws onto your tap, one that goes down the drain, and one that produces purified water. Basically all you need to do is turn it on and collect the water. Whether you produce it at home or pick it up at the fish store, reverse osmosis has really become a staple in reefing today. Using high quality water like this will greatly increase the likelihood of having a long term successful tank. The next step is to add your salt mix and mix up your water. You will need to select a salt mix to use. The best advice I can give you is find someone you trust, has a successful reef tank, and ask them what they use. Beyond that, I personally try to use salt mix produced by mid-sized companies that are owned and operated by people who are passionate about reefing rather than large publicly traded companies. At BRS, most of us are currently using the Red Sea Salt, but honestly, I've seen people be successful with almost every brand of salt out there, so it really isn't that big of a decision. Mixing the salt is pretty simple. You'll want to start with a food grade bin to house the water. The best option is fancy drums like these found at local plumbing suppliers, but the most common option is probably the Brute brand of trash can produced by Rubbermaid. Basically everyone I know in the hobby has used one of these to store water in at one time or another. After that, add a heater and a high flow power head like a Corellia to mix the water. We we'll want to heat the water to the same temperature as the tank which is typically around 78 degrees, then add our salt mix. The instructions on the salt mix should give a general idea of how much salt to add, but you want to use a tool like the hydrometer or refractometer to measure the salinity of the water. We're looking for a specific gravity of 1.026. Because they're so reliable and easy to operate, refractometers have become the most commonly recommended option. All you need to do is add a couple drops of water on the lens and look through the eyepiece to read the salinity of the water. It doesn't get much easier than that. The ongoing water needs basically end up being comprised of two things, water for water changes and water to replace evaporation. Everyone has their own idea of what a good water change schedule is and ranges from small daily changes to 50% a week to fairly infrequent. It's been my experience that a good water change schedule is one of the primary components of most long-term successful tanks. Conversely, it's also been my experience that most tanks that start off great but ultimately end up with issues somewhere around the one-year mark typically have one thing in common, an infrequent or irregular water change schedule. I personally try to change 20 to 30 percent every other week. With a mid-sized tank like a 40 gallon, that's only two to three five gallon buckets, which is pretty quick and easy. This can easily be done in less than a half hour, which means an entire water change schedule can collectively take less than an hour a month. Keeping on top of easy maintenance steps like this can really be the difference between a temporary hobby and something long term that results in a unique addition to your home or office and something everyone is envious of. You'll also need to replace evaporated water. Just a couple quick notes on this. While water evaporates, the salt doesn't. So when you top off the tank, you'll want to use fresh water. It's a good idea to have a container of fresh water near the tank so you can add some when you feed the fish. 
This is also something that's super easy to automate with auto top off systems that use a float switch or other probes to automatically replace water as it evaporates. There are a few nice options for auto top off systems. The JBJ, which is probably the most popular because it's inexpensive and works. The Tunzi Osmolator is a personal favorite because it's easy to install. The primary sensor doesn't rely on moving parts. It comes with a nice pump. And most importantly, it's never failed me. The Elos unit is the most low profile option, which works really nice on tanks where space is a premium, like tanks without a sump and you need a hang on option, or where the sump is already full and there's limited space. It can also be nice on all in one tanks like the Nuvos. Another major component of a new saltwater tank is a rock. Your rock will serve a few basic purposes, obvious visual appeal, homes for the tank inhabitants, but most importantly, the surface area of the rock hosts beneficial bacteria, which will serve as most reef aquariums' primary filtration. Most people unfamiliar with saltwater aquariums assume there must be a ton of fancy equipment that filters a tank. And while there certainly is equipment that will make it easier, in most cases, it's the rock itself that does the primary filtration. Beneficial bacteria populates the surface of the rock. It's this bacteria that will be your tank's primary filter. The various strains of bacteria will work in series to break down uneaten food as well as fish waste into relatively harmless substances, which are generally removed with water changes and other methods. The live bacteria is the primary reason rock sold to the aquarium industry is referred to as live rock. Live rock is typically harvested in the ocean, so it will probably come with some other live organisms as well. Most of these things are desirable, like purple coralline algae or tiny crustaceans like copepods and amphipods. Using live rock is one of the quickest ways to get a tank established and ready for livestock. It's also become increasingly popular to start with dry rock, which is essentially dead and allowed to repopulate with these bacteria strains and other organisms. The bacteria will populate naturally on its own, but you can boost it with bacterial products like Biospira. Generally, it will take a few extra weeks with dry rock before the bacteria populations reproduce and stabilize around the available food source. Introducing amphipods and copepods is generally as simple as adding a couple of corals, a small piece of rock, or a bit of sand from an established tank. Pods and coralline algae both have an exponential growth pattern, so it doesn't take long. For instance, this tank took about six months to go from zero coralline algae to at least 50 to 60 percent coverage, and the only coralline algae that was introduced was on the base of corals and backs of hermit or snail shells. So you might be asking, why go through all the trouble when you can just start with live rock? Honestly, most newer reefers probably will select live rock because it's the quickest and easiest path, and most new aquarium owners are fairly anxious to get the tank up and going as quick as possible. Can't say I blame them. Starting a new tank is pretty exciting, and it can be hard to be patient. But as you'll learn in this hobby, patience is really the key to long-term success. I think dry rock is a bit more popular with reefers who are setting up a second tank or rebooting an existing tank. By using dry rock, it's possible to limit the amount of organisms introduced to the tank. While live rock can come with some beneficial things, most of them are easily introduced to the tank. What can be really difficult is removing some of the pests that can be accidentally introduced with really anything live added to the tank, including live rock. Some of these pests include difficult to deal with algaes, pest anemones, bristle worms, as well as parasitic flatworms and isopods. A very large percentage of new reefers have dealt with at least one of these things in their first tank. Using dry rock won't eliminate the chances of introducing these, but it will drastically reduce the chances and almost certainly limit the types of pests you run into if you're careful afterwards. Beyond that, something everyone appreciates about dry rock is a lower cost. It's generally cheaper by the pound, but you also don't have to pay for water weight, and you can use standard ground shipping, which is commonly free, rather than expensive overnight shipping. Combined, these things can often make it half the cost. Generally speaking, we recommend about a pound and a half of live rock per gallon of tank size. With dry rock, we generally recommend three quarters to one pound per gallon, depending on the type of rock chosen. For instance, Pukani rock is known for being particularly light and porous, so you can go on the lighter side. Last thing we're going to cover today is sand. General rule of thumb is one pound of sand per gallon of tank size, which is often around two inches. 
the amount of sand is really fairly flexible. A portion of this is just an aesthetic issue. Some people like less, some people like more. Some people even like to go with a bare bottom because it makes a tank easier to clean. You may want to consider the type of fish you plan on having as well. Popular fish like sand sifting gobies as well as wrasses that sleep in the sand are going to prefer at least two inches. If none of your tank's inhabitants have any sand requirements, I personally prefer about one to one and a half inches of sand because it makes it easier to turn over and clean during maintenance. Sand also comes in a variety of sizes. Some of this is aesthetic appeal and some of its function. Many people like the look of small grain Bahamas sand or oolite because it reminds them of their favorite beach, but it can be really difficult to deal with. The small grains blow around really easily. In most reef tanks, which have higher flow rates, it can be a pain to deal with the sand blowing all over. The most common size sand we sell by a large margin is the Fiji pink from Carib Sea. This is roughly twice the size of the Bahamas sand, so it stays in place easier, but still has a nice fine look. These two sizes, which are on the fine side, are also some of the best options if you're interested in keeping sand sifting gobies. If you have a really high flow tank or problem spots, you might want to look into their special grade or crushed coral sizes. If you already have some of the finer sand in your tank, it's certainly possible to add some of the larger grain sands to problem spots that continually get blown around. It will probably get mixed over time, so you might have to occasionally add more. Sand also comes in two versions, live and dry. Live meaning it has beneficial bacteria, but really nothing else. For the most part, live and dry are about the same cost, so many people end up using live. Carib Sea has dominated the aquarium sand industry for a long time and really a leader in the industry. They sell live sand in two basic forms, their popular Aragalive brand and the Ocean Direct brand. The primary difference here is the Aragalive was dried and sifted out, then packaged in water with dormant bacteria, which is designed to wake up when added to a warm, well-oxygenated environment with a food source like an aquarium. The Ocean's Direct brand is a bit different. The sand is packaged moist rather than wet and in a breathable bag, which allows them to preserve the stand with its original bacteria strains that naturally work well together. All that said, the beneficial bacteria is going to populate regardless. These types of things just speed the process up a bit. If I had to make a personal preference, in most cases I would probably choose the Fiji Pink Aragalive if I was starting a new tank with live rock and the original Great Ocean Direct with dry rock. That wraps up today's episode. If you'd like to be notified when new episodes come out, sign up for our newsletter. Thank you for watching BRS TV.